Um, is anyone interested in reading the scripture this morning? I have a rant to rock, paper, scissors. Amy! <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> is everybody okay? <laughs> Just give my heart a little chance to restart. Okay. <laughs> That'd be lovely. Okay, so the scripture reading is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him. runs the same way, right? Jesus is on his journey to Jerusalem and to the cross. And a rich man respectfully bows before him and asks, you know, what must I do? And Jesus says, show obedience to God. And the rich man says, I have done so all my life. And then Jesus says, well, then sell all your goods and follow me. It's a, it's a very basic call to discipleship story, right? We, we've seen this a bunch of times. And in Mark, at least, it's the only time where someone is called to be a disciple and then goes away. It's a story about discipleship and possessions and how we should give our wealth away. So, it surprises exactly no one when it gets used to kick off a stewardship campaign, which is what we're doing today. When this story in Mark was written, the, the people who followed Jesus knew people who had known Jesus before the crucifixion and maybe even some who knew him after the resurrection. There was a feeling that Jesus was going to return literally any day. And the early church did try to share resources to hold wealth in a common purse. And humans being humans, that went about as well as you think it did. But once it became clear that Jesus was not coming back during the lifetime of the people who knew him personally, the interpretation of this passage shifted. It was the people who were entering religious orders, right? They were the ones who were to sell everything that they owned and embrace poverty. And we still see that today, right? Nuns and monks who are entering religious orders do take a vow of poverty. 
The only person I know, you know, myself, who has taken that vow, told me that it was actually the hardest part of the vows that she took. Because even if she decided later to leave the order, she had lost so much ground financially, she would live in poverty for the rest of her life, even if she hadn't continued to live with the order. It terrified her family. And I can see why. Even though they, they supported her, they supported her decision, they thought it was the right thing, it frightened them that she, would, if she might come to the end of her life with nothing. So then we go on in time, and the Protestant Revolution comes along, and we look at this passage again, and here's what we do. We say, absolutely. This particular rich man needed to sell all his possessions and give to the poor. But it was just that guy. He, he had trouble being seduced by his possessions. All of us have something we love more than we love God. Now, maybe it's possessions, sure. But maybe it's fame, or maybe it's reputation, or power, or beauty, whatever. The point is not to allow anything to possess us more than our desire to inherit the kingdom of God. It's not about wealth and possession. It's about what takes us away from God. That's how the passage has gotten interpreted. As I read it, it's about wealth and Right? I think that Peter and the rest of the disciples, you know, they did walk away from their possessions, their families, their jobs. And I think for some of them, some of what they walked away from wasn't a sacrifice as much as it was just stuff that was in the way. Right? They didn't give it up so much as just sort of drop it and keep going. And maybe this sounds like a weird analogy, but and I've, and I've mentioned it before. There was a time when I would struggle to go do my strength training at the gym twice a week. I would get there and then sit in the parking lot and decide if I was going in or not. And I was finally so frustrated that I just said, I'm not deciding anymore. I'm just going to do it twice a week. I don't decide that I'm going to brush my teeth. I don't decide that I'm going to make my bed. I just do it. I'm just going to do it. And I'll tell you, the quality of my life went through the roof once I stopped dithering about whether I was going to do this thing or not. I left it behind. <coughs> I think it was like that for some of the disciples and for some of the things they left behind. But I also know that when I got off the corporate track and went into ministry, my disposable income went down. I had to be a lot more careful about throwing away possessions because it became harder to replace them, right? I now think more about vegetable peelers because I don't want to buy three of them before I find one that works well and feels good in my hand. And I think more about what gives me real pleasure. You know I love audiobooks, but let me tell you, I am the queen of working the borrowing process at libraries I have no rights to borrow from, but I'm on their list. The way this passage is used during a church stewardship campaign usually runs something like this. Don't be like that guy. Don't go away grieving and not follow Jesus just to keep your stuff. Sell your stuff and give it to the poor. The poor old church. Fill out your pledge card today. And I'm not going to say that. Especially since I'm not about to sell my stuff. I don't think it's believable. And I don't think it's faithful even though I really think that Jesus truly meant that to be his disciple, you need to do just that. Here's, here's what I would say. Most of us are not like Peter and the rest, willing to walk away from everything, possessions, family, jobs, community, reputations, power, connections. I don't know, maybe it's something in our primate brains that if we did meet Jesus face to face, heart to heart, body to body, it would be easier. But until 
until I came face to face with this passage and had to admit to myself that indeed Jesus was telling me personally that my possessions were keeping me from truly following Jesus, I don't think I appreciated how much I was playing the game of this world and not of the kingdom of God. So sure, I can have a well-researched vegetable peeler. And sure, maybe it can help with the potatoes for the senior luncheon on the 26th of October. But even when I am just peeling my own lone spud for supper, maybe I could use the peeling time to think about how better to love my neighbor, whose alarm goes off every weekday at 4 a.m. through the neighbor's <laughs> bin walls. Instead of listening to some stupid podcast about the presidential election. Maybe instead of using my possessions to protect me from the sharp edges of this world around me, I can invite those possessions to connect me with God, with the God I obey, and whose disciple I would like to be. If that's what they do, maybe, yeah, maybe I need fewer possessions and would have more resources to give to the church. Every year when I fill out my pledge card, I increase the amount, aiming to increase it 10% every year. And I will be honest, there have been years when that hurt. That was hard. But in the end, I never seem to miss the possessions I don't buy, and I'm always pretty tickled about what the church can do to make a difference in people's lives. Make it easier for them to come into loving relationship with God and with their neighbors. Now, I firmly believe that Jesus calls us to live in the real world. And in the real world, in the end, we are going to let go of all of these possessions. Maybe we'll leave them behind in the house for our kids to get rid of. But in the end, those possessions are not coming with us. Maybe they can offer protection from the real world, or maybe they can help us get to that place of deep discipleship. I don't know. But I do know that filling out a pledge card is a place to stop and think, just for a bit, about how you want to join Jesus on that journey that is headed to the cross and beyond. Our possessions are part of that decision, whether we make it consciously or not, they're part of that journey. And we can decide what we want to do about them on next year's leg of that journey, and how we want to come closer to being the disciples that Jesus is calling us to be. And that's something I've been reflecting on all 